Okay, I am an entomologist by training. I spent most of my life doing river conservation work. I was also chairman of the Illinois Pollution Control Board, so I'm not a botanist. I'm gonna talk about wildflowers, things that I largely learned personally by growing them mainly with my kids. So I am not a botanist. So I will make an occasional mistake that a botanist wouldn't. Uh, woodland wildflowers, particularly the spring ones, are extremely beautiful. Many of them are ephemeral and they last only a few weeks or months, depending on where you are in the woods. But they include things like jack in the pulpits and trilliums and bluebells and many others. And like many of our natural resources that are alive, they're in danger. One of the most important books you could read if you're interested in the future of the woods as an ecosystem is Bringing Nature Home, and that's on my handout, wherever the handouts are in the room, by Douglas Twalamy. It's a wonderful book. I think it's going to be the current equivalent to Silent Spring. In a few great chapters, he explains what many people take three semesters to learn in college about the importance of native plants to our native insects, to our native birds, and thus the entire ecosystem. If you're interested in your grandkids and maybe yourself in your old age ever seeing butterflies and fireflies, it'd probably be a good idea to follow some of the precepts of this book. And the scale on this goes from a flower pot in your apartment window all the way to a woods the size of which many of you own. And with that, I'll mention most of the talks I've given in the last 20 years have been to homeowners and small landowners and hobby farmers. Many of you, I realize, have the real forest, so you'll have to scale up some of the things I'm talking about if you're interested. But the basic principles are what we're interested in. Uh, going back to the book I just mentioned, Bringing Nature Home, some of the things that Dr. Talamy mentions that I'll summarize very quickly, as most of us know, plants are at the base of the food chain. But what most people don't know is that nationally and even internationally, the landscape has changed dramatically over the last 40 years or so. Native plants have almost nowhere to thrive, particularly in the United States. Non-native plants largely dominate urban and rural areas. The new subdivisions being built contain almost nothing but grass and ornamental plants from other continents. The roadsides are the same way. The roadside ditches are full of Phragmites and other plants. We have all kinds of invasive plants taking over our woods, our prairies, and our wetlands. Most insects, this is what most people don't realize, most insect herbivores can only eat the plants with which they share a common evolutionary history. That's extremely important since about 96% of terrestrial birds feed their young insects and insect parts, even if the adult eats nuts and berries. Bottom line is, without a serious amount of native plants, we are not only in danger of losing a lot of our insects, but also the birds. A quick slide on some of these, I'm not gonna do the whole slide, just a couple items, but if you look at Melaleuca, which is invasive in Florida, in its native homeland, that woody species supports 109, 409 species of insects and other herbivores that eat it. In the United States, only eight species of insects have been documented eating the leaves of this plant. And it's been here 120 years. So in 120 years, only eight of our native species have been able to use that for food. If you look at clematis, for example, it's got 40 species on it where it originates, one species uses it in the United States, it's been here for 100 years. If you look at native trees, for example, and again, won't do the whole list, but the book is fascinating because it brings a lot of these points out. Oaks in the genus Quercus support 534 <coughs> Lepidoptera species, butterflies and moths. If you look at ash trees, there's 150 species of butterflies and moths. That doesn't even begin to count the others that can live on this plant. But if you've got only non-native trees in your subdivisions and you let a lot of non-natives move into your woods, you make this problem much worse for anything native. You just heard a little bit about the turkeys, some of you. 
Well, it goes around. I'm going to run through some slides I took. I took this slide about 40 years ago at a research site I had at Carlinville, Illinois. It's a woods that's being turned into a subdivision. They left a few trees. If those of you who remember Vietnam, you heard the statement, uh, we had to destroy the village in order to save it. People who leave the city to go live in the woods, they frequently destroy the woods in order to live in it. Here is a typical woodland lot in a county in Illinois. It used to look like this, but when they built their house, the developer cut down most of the trees, eliminated the understory, and planted grass. Um, our floodplains, Mississippi River, Illinois River, all of our floodplains have been radically modified by Corps of Engineer dams, by levees, and by channelization. Now here is a tiny remnant of wooded floodplain in, I think that's uh, Douglas County, Illinois. And here's what is done to those areas when back in the 70s when the Soil Conservation Service did their PL-566 projects, all of the trees and understory along the streams for many, many miles is wiped out. Road commissioners, they found herbicides about 1970 when I took this picture in Macoupin County. They go down the road and they spray the trees, so the, this half of the tree is sprayed. But more importantly, the understory is also killed and it's basically taken over by invasive species. Um, they're putting cable in all over the country right now. And what are they doing in a rural area and put the cable in? They just rip a hole in the ground, roll out the cable, turn the soil upside down, and invasive species are able to move in dramatically. Railroads used to be one of the last major refuges along with pioneer cemeteries for a lot of our native forbs, the little flowering prairie plants. Well, the railroads also have discovered herbicides and they go down their right of way and spray. So now, thousands and thousands of miles of railroad that used to provide a corridor where insects could move laterally or north, south, east, west, whatever direction from one habitat to another are being totally eliminated in terms of native plants. We're losing our hedgerows. Now, a little area like this has a dramatically different microclimate than the adjacent plowed farmland. There's probably some original soil here. In Illinois, there's about a foot difference between the soil in the hedgerow and the field due to erosion and compaction. But a lot of insects and birds, bacteria, original soil critters can still live in the fence rows and hedgerows. And this is what we're getting. Again, this is Macoupin County, Illinois, where I did a lot of work. The whole point of that last series of slides is simply that we are losing habitat all over the place and there's very little left that isn't being modified. People often say, oh, well, the little bit I'm doing isn't important, but everybody's doing it, including the government, and there's a lot of loss involved with that. Uh, this is a roadside near Pekin, Illinois, which has some natural vegetation left, but the bulk of our roadsides look like this. In the rural areas, someone has convinced the farmers that their roadside has to look like somebody's lawn in a new subdivision or they're not a good farmer. Um, managed wildlife. Now, when I was a kid, seeing a deer in central Illinois was a big deal. We managed deer to bring them back. We did a really wonderful job. <laughs> the problem with a lot of wildlife management is they manage them back but after they're back, they don't know how to manage them at a reasonable level. And this is a picture of some trilliums. I was in the woods, a local park, a couple of years ago, and there was a field of like two, just <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of trilliums along this path. I took my kids back there a few days later to see them, and virtually every trillium had been chewed off by a deer. So that's another problem. Now, you've heard about invasive species. Uh, those of you who are familiar with ancient history, you've heard of a uh, Roman phalanx or a Persian phalanx. I think these are Persians, note the little knots on the head. The invasive species that we're experiencing now are very much like that. This is teasel along a roadside in Illinois. Notice the little Persian hats. But everything is gone except the teasel. And in the ditches you'll have uh, reed canary grass and some other things growing, or phragmites. So the bottom line here is that 
thousands and thousands of miles of road are losing what little native species they had. And one of the most important native species along the roadsides was always milkweed. And you've probably been hearing about the plight of the monarch, which is a whole other hour talk, which I won't give today. But again, wherever you look, we're losing. And here is a bush honeysuckle. This is on the campus of the University of Illinois. We're going to try and remove that on April 20th if anybody wants to bring a chainsaw and gloves down. Uh, you've heard about uh, garlic mustard. It's a rather pretty plant in some ways. Here it is standing up. It smells nice if you smash it in your fingers. But each one of these plants generates hundreds of seeds. The seeds completely blanket the forest floor and shade out the forest floor where other seeds from native plants might try to grow a little later. Garlic mustard, teasel, and some of these others, they, they start to grow very early in the spring. This is a woodland, University of Illinois Research Park, completely covered with teasel, excuse me, that's garlic mustard. So again, you can see the extent. Here's a roadside in Illinois in a shady area, shady enough for the garlic mustard to grow right up the hillside. Uh, the climate zones have changed. USDA has uh, issued new climate maps. Uh, everything in pink here has moved north one climate, one, uh, what do they call those? Uh, hardiness zones. And you'll notice that where I live, central Illinois, things have moved up quite a bit. So there's some changes in climate that have been recognized by the people who do the hardiness zones. Now, if plants are going to survive they're going to have to move, many of them will anyway, have to move to accommodate the new climate situation. So as the temperature changes, you'll see various plants are going to start growing further north. Well, they've got to be able to get there somehow. And without a corridor, they have very, a lot of trouble because their seeds have to move for them to move. Dandelions don't have much trouble. So let's mention just fragmentation for a minute. Various habitat types are increasingly isolated from each other. You've got in Illinois, woodlots might be a mile or five miles apart. Little pieces of prairie are many miles apart. The insects that live in these areas, many of them can't fly more than a mile or two. Little bees and things of that nature. A lot of the animals in uh, various woodland areas or prairie areas, they will not or are very uncomfortable crossing farmland, roads, and things like that. So if there's no connections like railroad rights away, highway rights away, or woodlands close enough for them to fly or move too comfortably, these animals are not going to be able to move. Additionally, they have to inbreed because they cannot exchange genetic material over a distance if the uh, males and females can't get there or the seeds can't get there. It's also difficult to recolonize. If a certain particular woodlot is hit by an accidental herbicide or pesticide spraying, kills off the wildflowers or the bees or something, if there's not another woodland nearby or prairie nearby with the right species, the bees can't get back in to that woodlot. Um, if you want to think about this a little bit, Think of how readily dandelions spread. I, I'm told that dandelions made it to California before the white man, and they were brought in from Europe. Uh, West Nile virus is an excellent example of how something can move quickly. The West Nile virus came in the United States, and three years later, it came in New York, and three years later, it was in California because it infected birds and mosquitoes. And the birds and the mosquitoes together have enough mobility that they move this virus all over the place. A jack in the pulpit doesn't have that ability, or a little bee doesn't have that ability to move. Uh, here's some native bees, except for that one. That one's from Europe. I'm an entomologist. I did a lot of work in the 1970s at Carlinville, Macoupin County, Illinois, which is the bee capital of the world as far as I'm concerned. But Here's some different bees many of you have probably never seen. Uh, Macoupin County had 300 different kinds of bees in it. Now, in between 1884 and 1916, an individual collected bees at Carlinville, Illinois on 400 some different kinds of plants. And he did this between 1916 
1884 and 1916. I duplicated a small portion of that study in 1971, and on the species Claytonia virginica, which you know is spring beauty, I found essentially the same bees in 1971 that he found in the 1880s up to 1916. Someone repeated my study in 2009, a group led by Burkle from uh, Washington University at St. Louis, and they only found half as many species of bees on this woodland wildflower that I found. So between 2009 and 1910, Burkle and her group, which I was a part of, this is published uh, last 2013 in Science, they found a 50% loss in all of the spring bees. Charles Robertson, who did the original study in the late 1800s, found 109 species of spring woodland wildflower bees. These people were only able to collect 54 species, and they spent a lot of time doing it. Most bee species are single females. They're solitary bees. After mating, the single female is active for either a few weeks in the spring or a few weeks in the fall or possibly in the summer. And their young spend much of their time as an immature form in a rearing cell. However, others like bumblebees and honeybees and a few others, they're active all year. The take home message there is if you have a woodlot or a prairie, it's a good idea to try and encourage plants that bloom, some in the spring, some in the summer, some in the fall, so the bees always have something to eat as well as the other insects. I focus on bees, but the same is true of beetles, butterflies, et cetera, in terms of needing resources throughout the year. Uh, pollinators like people, they need food, a nesting area, water, uh, suitable habitat with all of that in it, and the resources have to be available when the insects are active. And bees in particular are vulnerable to natural and man-made disturbances. Bees, many of them, about 70% of the bees, and there's like 6,000 different bees in the U.S., about 70% of them nest in the ground. These are bee nests. You'll see many times in your woods an aggregation of many little bees flying around in the spring. There's one with her nest there. She's going down into the ground. Underground, these nests can be done by one bee, or several bees might share a nest, but not the nesting chambers. Other bees nest in the stems of twigs, in holes, in dead logs, in the woods, in standing trees where a woodpecker's made a hole or a beetle's made a hole. So you've got a lot of different ecological niches where critters live. This is an ant nest. It's Pranolepis imparase. It's the Illinois equivalent of the western honey ant. A little nest. They dig very deep nests. You can see the subsoil has been brought up. They move woodland wildflower seeds around. This is, these are ants taking the seeds off trillium. They also take it from um, any number of plants, including bloodroot, and they scatter the seeds around. Uh, Claytonia virginica, spring beauty. I'm going to emphasize the bees on several plants here. There's different kinds of bees. This is a very wide generalist plant. It's easy for any bee to get pollen or nectar from it. There are 21 species of long-tongued bees and 37 species of short-tongued bees collected at Carlinville, Illinois in the 18, late 1800s by Charles Robertson on that plant. Um, Bluebells is another favorite, but the flower is differently shaped, and we won't go into great detail, but because of the shape of this flower, it's suitable mainly for bees with a long tongue that can reach way in. So 16 long-tongued bees were found on that plant and only two short-tongued. Penstemon is a plant that is largely attuned to long-tongued bees, but also can handle some short-tongued bees. Again, these are plants that can be pretty common in the woods. Jacob's Ladder is another generalist. Long-tongued and short-tongued bees like it. Uh, here's the Ipomea pandorata. And there's 14 long tongues, and no short tongue bees use it. And uh, I can also mention that gourds are good. A lot of tree species support a variety of bees, too. Uh, this is, I believe, black cherry or wild cherry, Prunus serotina. There's 23 short and seven long tongue bees on that, plus a host of other critters. Uh, one of the champion wildflowers is what we used to call Aster pelosus, the hairy white field aster. It had 90 species of bees, 54 other hymenoptera, and 119 flies, and 30 
butterflies and moths that were found on this one plant in the fall. It's a very important plant. Now, let's get into some of the other characteristics of wildflowers. Many of you have probably noticed in your woods, if you've still got wildflowers, that some of them seem to dominate at certain times. There's huge fields of bluebells in many areas. May apples tend to make wonderful little clusters. And these plants are doing this in response to soil conditions like moisture, micronutrients, differences in light, all kinds of microclimate and microhabitat issues which in many cases are poorly understood. They also, some of them need certain soil bacteria and other things to thrive. Now here's another plant that's made a cluster. This is a trout lily. Now in a lot of these plants, as we'll see in a minute, they, they come and go early in the spring, leaving some niches. Now here's bloodroot. This is not of woods, obviously. This guy had a a condition in his leg that let him let his yard grow wild instead of mowing it every year and for about 30 years he left it alone and these uh, blood roots took over. If you go to certain areas in the woods you'll notice that some plants seem to prefer or grow best along a trail or a path where the lighting conditions are different than they are in the deeper woods. Uh, this is a flock species Blue-eyed Mary also has a habit like that. But you can see that your different plants have affinities for different conditions. So let's be a little unscientific for a moment and give you some anthropomorphic thoughts on life in a Darwinian woods. Or in other words, what would Caesar do if he was in a deep, dark woods? <laughs> well, he does this. That's a Roman testudo formation. They have their shields all around them and over them, and it's pretty hard for somebody to get an arrow or a spear in there and do too much damage, at least to the whole group, because they're protecting each other. Let's look at some of our plants that are competing for light. Now remember in the woods, a lot of the woodland wildflowers, they come up early in the spring, they've got to get their business done, get pollinated, and at least start getting some seeds to grow before the canopy closes over and takes most of the light. So light is at a premium. So here's a group of trillium. Does that look at all like a Roman formation when you look at how the leaves are positioned? And notice that almost no leaf is totally shaded. Now, that might be just a simple accident, or maybe there's something in the evolution of these plants. Uh, here is a uh, shooting star. Leaves are at the base, and they're kind of protecting the center here, and sometimes they will fold down if there's a stand of these. This is in my yard, I grow these. But um, if they're together, all these plants butt up against each other and the leaves overlap. Here you have may apples, a very dense group of may apples with a few bluebells sticking up in between. I took my camera and went down below, and it looks like the Amazon rainforest floor. <laughs> The May apples are shading out the rest of the understory below them. And it probably helps them make those little clusters you see because they're keeping other plants from germinating or at least doing very well as seedlings under their mature plants. Now here are bluebells at one of my university experimental plots. Notice how the lower leaves, when they're alone, come all the way down, creating a very shady area under what I call the mother plant. If you're into ancient alien theory, think about mothership. And we'll show you some things about bluebells in a minute. But these plants also, many of them, protect themselves down below. Now, once the Romans get enough power, they start expanding their, their reign a bit. Now, this is wild ginger in the spring. Each plant sends out a shoot pretty much at ground level. It's spear-shaped. It can push its way around. And then they, after a while, the stems rise up and you get a nice, dense, solid mat of leaves shading out everything below, including whatever small plants they sent that shoot over. So they tend to battle for space. And this is a yard in Urbana where a woman had me put in some wildflowers for her. We put a little clump 
of ginger here and there. We put a little clump of May apple here and there. These have been in for about a year now. We, we just put in a few little plants. And if you've got a res restoration area, rather than try and put lots of plants everywhere, put a few of each species in different places and see where they're happy, where they will grow well. Okay, the same spot a year later looks like this. And most of those plants had a, we had a fair fight here. All of the plants were basically the same size so the ginger is budding up against the geranium, which is budding up against the celandine poppy, and they can coexist this way if nobody has a super advantage when they start out. And you'll see also uh, Solomon seal is coming up. They, they can rise above the other plants. They're not thick enough to kill them, but they can survive. Uh, May apples, Underground, they send a stem six to eight inches out, two or three stems per node for each plant. And what they're doing is expanding underground. And then when the time is right in the spring, this bud pops up and they can undermine, if you follow the history of castles, anybody watch the, the uh, castle show that's so popular with the dragons and that, but they will send the May apples. This is a May apple plant. They've got a huge group of May apples here. They send their shoots into the ginger patch underground, and then they pop up. And over time, since the May apples are taller than the ginger, they will take that territory, castle and all. Um, many of our woodland wildflowers I classify as spikers or spreaders. Things like May apples and trillium and Solomon seal, they come up early in the spring and they spike. They push themselves up. They're going to rise above, they have to push their way through leaf litter in many cases. They might have to push their way through some other plants, but basically they come up. Jacob's ladder, uh, wild geranium and several others on the other hand are what I call a spreader. They appear early in the spring but their leaves stay at ground level and their stems stay at ground level for a while. And if you watch some of them like Jacob's Ladder, if you have a warm day in Illinois in February or January, the Jacob's Ladder will send out little shoots right at ground level, soak up as much sun as they can, and when you get a hard freeze, they go away again. They don't spend much energy doing that. But there's a lot of these plants, they come out at ground level in the spring. I think it has something to do with falling ice and branches and things like that. Okay, so if you're talking about gardening and marketing woodland wildflowers to homeowners, a lot of homeowners, they want something pretty most of the time, meaning green or blooming or something. So you can put a spiking wildflower into a bed of English ivy or vinca or whatever else homeowners like to have right next to their house and the trilliums and the may apples and the bluebells and the jack in the pulpits will rise above, be pretty all spring, then they go dormant and they're completely resorbed into the ground. No mowing, no cutting, no trimming. And then for the rest of the season, you can have vinca if you like it. Vinca, of course, is a terrible invasive in the woods, but we're talking a little bit about uses. Another thing to know is that because a lot of plants in the, the wildfires, the spring ephemerals, they go dormant in the, later in the spring, like uh, the dogtooth violet here, or the trout lily, they're very abundant for a while, then they go completely away. So mixed in with a bed of trout lily, you can have may apples, you can have uh, uh, trillium, any number of species that are basically spikers that, that grow and bloom a little bit later than the earliest of the spring wildflowers. Some other characteristics to think about are how does the plant spread its seed or establish itself? Now, this is a really clever plant. This is the uh, wild geranium maculatum. I don't know if you ever tried to play, pick the seeds off them, but you can get your eye banged because these little seeds are kind of explosively dehiscent. They've got a little spring on them. And you can see the seed there, and when it's ripe, the spring releases, and it'll flick the seed six to eight feet. It can sting you. So 
these plants, if you're trying to reestablish plants in a wood lot or in a yard or a big area, a lot of people are doing restorations, trying to get plants back into their woods. You can put a few sprigs of these plants in, this geranium maculatum, and they'll throw their own seeds around year after year. So you don't have to plant millions of plants to get something started. Now, this plant also does something else interesting. The, this is a first year seedling. I think this is a second year seedling, but they start making a rhizome. And after a few years, the rhizome can be huge. This is about six or seven inches in diameter. And each little bud here puts up a shoot. When you saw those earlier pictures, these can be a very dominant plant. Well, they send out those shoots and a root mass like this, whoops, like that, can probably completely dominate a two-foot circle with their leaves. So th these plants have a lot of power, but they're slow to get started. Uh, here's spring beauty. This is a favorite for the bees in the spring. Uh, one of the reasons we talk about not digging up plants in the wild, first off, it's largely illegal in many areas, but you can also do some damage. The spring beauty has a corm or a bulb, almost like a nut, that starts out very small and gets big with time, but this will send out dozens of shoots, which can be more than a foot long. So you may see the flower and the stem over here, but the bulb can be over there. So this is a very interesting way for the plant to disperse because it's got very tiny seeds, so if it's, the bulb is here and it's putting out a flowering stem that's going to bloom over there, the seeds are going to fall at least a foot away from the original plant. Uh, something else to know is that some of these woodland wildflowers bloom, or not bloom, but they grow again in the fall. The spring beauty goes completely dormant, usually by May, but then in late fall, it will send out shoots again to gather sunlight after the leaves have fallen from the trees and there's sunlight available again on the forest floor. Jacob's Ladder does the same thing. So if you're thinking about putting a herbicide down to control garlic mustard or something, you might want to be a little bit careful about some of the plants that you think are dormant but maybe aren't. Here's an interesting plant, uh, Uvularia, the bellwort. It makes a big, heavy plant with lots of stems, and it can defend itself very well because it's about two and a half feet tall in many cases. But if you look at them, they tend to be not in clusters like, say, may apples, but there's a whole bunch of stems real close together. And if you dig one up and uh, spray it and untie it, you can untie the root system. All of these plants, there's about 10 of them there, were in that one cluster. So they can, I, I use the term defend themselves. It's not really scientifically appropriate, but in many ways, that's what they're doing. Uh, columbine is something you want to be careful of. It's a very beautiful plant. Hummingbirds like it. A lot of bees like it. But when the pretty red flower is done, it points itself to the sky, and these little tubes are each filled with about 50 little black seeds that are very prolific. And when the wind blows, the plant goes like that and the seeds go flying in all directions, and there's lots of them. Now, this is a, I think, about a 20 by 10 inch growing tray. I just sprinkled a few hundred seeds on it, and look what I got. So when I use these in my woodland wildflower plantings, especially in town or a, a natural type area, we put very few of them in because they're gonna spread rapidly and if I've got time in the fall, I, or as soon as they're ripe and they're done flowering, I go and cut the seed heads off so that they don't take over the whole place. Now, once a woodland wildflower group is established, that's not much of a problem. But most people, they put in all their plants at once. And if you do that, the ones that have advantages like this can take over. Uh, here's a little Jacob's Ladder. And all around it, you see little seedlings growing. So you can see that this, the seeds get dropped and they take off if they're allowed to. Now bluebells are interesting. Bluebells start out with a small seed and they start to make a rhizome. This one's about three years old. This is a brand new seedling. 
Well, that process continues. And you can get a bluebell that's almost as big as a football underground. But do you remember when you were kids before the chocolate companies started cheating? And you would, on Easter Sunday, you'd want the great big Easter bunny and you'd ignore the little Easter bunny, and then you bit into the big Easter bunny, and what happened? It's hollow. Okay, same thing here. Um, another reason not to dig wildflowers you don't know anything about is some of them are like your Easter bunnies. The small bluebell, I'll talk about this more in the propagation talk later. The next talk is propagation in here, but these things are hollow. So if you go in there with a shovel, you tend to crush them. They're also like a carrot. They, they snap easily. So if you dig a big bluebell, you're going to mess it up. And then it might get an infection, and it might contaminate some other things. It's a problem. The best bluebells to take are the little chocolate bunnies, the ones that are maybe two to three years old, and we'll talk about that next. Now, a lot of these plants, because of their characteristic of going dormant, are extremely useful in town if people only knew they could do a lot of good for their insects and other critters by putting in some wildflowers. This is my backyard, property line. My neighbor likes wildflowers, so we put a whole row of bluebells all the way across the backyard. And they bloom in the spring, and by June they're completely gone. No mowing, no cutting, no picking. They just go away. They, they absorb their juices into the bottom. But they're very pretty for a short time. I shouldn't say that. They're actually very pretty for several weeks. Then you can mow it. Here is a yard in Urbana that has a lot of trees on it. You know, under a, a big tree in town, the grass is hard to grow. It's patchy. Well, this person lets the bluebells grow. Every spring, this yard comes up in bluebells, and they're very pretty. The bumblebees love them. Other bees love them. The neighbors come and look. And they go completely dormant about May, and then there's violets and a little bit of grass and other things that grow in that yard, and they mow it, and everybody's happy. So there's any number of spring ephemerals you can do that with. Now here's spring beauty, again, my favorite bee plant. This is a very old yard in Urbana. This planting might go back to the pre-settlement days. This is spring beauty. This is an apartment house, and these have been here every spring, and I've been there 40 years, not living there, but uh, I watch this every year. The, the plants grow along about end of April, early May. They're dormant, landowner mows them, scraggly grass grows, everybody's happy. Uh, you can put a lot of these plants together. Remember I said if you give the plants an even chance, many of them can survive together, although they will sort themselves out, which is a term a lot of people use. The microclimate, the shade, the amount of sun they get, all those things affect what the plants will do, how well they'll grow, and you never really know what's going to happen. But here's one of my neighbors in Urbana. This is the street, a brick street. The sidewalk is up here, a brick sidewalk. It's maybe six feet from here to there and five or six feet this way. Bluebells, geranium, selenine poppy, ginger, and columbine have all been in this spot for at least six years before I took that picture. They are all relatively aggressive, but they're in some kind of, I'll use the term balance, in this yard. So it's not a winner-take-all situation as long as they've got a chance. This is my current front yard um, at probably its prettiest. You can see a whole range of plants are growing up. Lots of bees, lots of flies, lots of beetles, lots of critters. Now, to give you an idea of how some of these things can work with microclimate or a house, and it works in the woods too. If, if you've got a woods around here, you've probably got some, some ups and downs in them, some little ridges. And look at the north side and the south side this spring and see which plants bloom where at what time, and you'll find on the south side, a lot of the woodland wildflowers bloom two to three weeks before the ones on the north side. That's a very good thing for the bees and things because you get pollen and nectar on the south side, then they fly over the hill and they get them on the south side for a while. Did I get that wrong? South side, then the north side. But anyway, 
the plants, they don't all bloom at exactly the same time. And that adds diversity of resources to the woods, even if it's just a couple species, because they bloom at different times depending on their moisture and their light conditions and when the snow melted. You know, the, the snow melt has something to do with the soil temperature. All right, this is a building in an experimental plot I had at the University of Illinois. Um, here's, we, we had very many union and other restrictions on us, so we couldn't do much. But we put a row of bluebells here and here. We put um, a few trillium in that you see there, a lot of geranium, some celandine poppy, et cetera. But look what happens. This is April 18th, 2008. Pay attention to the bluebells first. Okay, what happened there? Oh, April 24th, just about six days later, you can see those bluebells are rather large. And they're starting to bloom. The geraniums are making their tortoise formation. Celandine poppies are hunkered down, but they're starting to bloom. And you can just barely see these bluebells coming up over here. They're at least a week behind those that are already in bloom. And this is only about six feet. What's going on here is that I believe the soil temperature is warmer here because of where the building is. So the building heat is transferring to the soil. Um, by May 5th, didn't I do that right? Yeah, by May 5th, the original bluebells are looking scraggly, but the ones that were a week behind are now in full bloom. So you can see even in an area this small, you can get a lot of seasonal diversity. The selenine poppy here is pretty much done. Selenine poppy there is just coming into bloom. Hidden in here are some, there's a trillium that's hard to see. The geraniums are pushing up very strongly. You can see a few of them in bloom. By May 16th, these bluebells are dormant. That selenine's dormant. The geraniums are in full bloom. It looks like they're in control or dominating, but they really aren't. They're just doing their thing. It's their time to shine. And the bluebells over here are still in bloom. And you can see how limited an area we had to work with because of the rules we had to operate under. This wasn't, we didn't get to do anything over here. So then what happens? Well, by July 30th, the area is still green. It's not as pretty as a lot of homeowners would like it to be or people with various things they want to show off. There's a few prairie species, um, some Rudbeckia snuck in over here somehow. But basically it's still green. If you want to gussy something like this up, if you're trying to market wildflowers to somebody, you say, okay, if you don't like the fact that there's almost nothing in bloom here, you can put a row of hostile, I mean hostas, you can put a row of hostas <laughs> up there in front and they'll be in bloom and pretty and green when the wildflowers are looking a bit scraggly. You can also go to Kmart or Walmart and buy a flat of um, the little red flowers, impatiens, these sterile non-native impatiens that do not propagate. And you can put them in front. It's a lot of work, but it makes it a little prettier. And here we are, the same site in October 29th of that year. And it looks like a lot of places that have annual flowers in it. But these are mostly, like I say, these are woodland and most of the material here will be completely gone in a few weeks. Here's another planting at the University of Illinois just to show you how these things can take over if you want. This is a sidewalk heavily traveled at the University of Illinois. They let us put in a number of woodland wildflower species here. The geraniums are put along the sidewalk edge because they are very hardy. You can stomp on them, you'll hurt them, but it's hard to kill them. You can ride a bike on them, you'll hurt them, but that's hard to kill them. Two years later, it was filled in like that, and the kids still managed to kill a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see it's filled in. If you want to see it when it's pretty, here it is in 2006 when it was in bloom. But we didn't just put those in. Those are the edge. That's kind of like a palisade. And then over in the rest of the area, we had other species like here's celandine poppies and may apples and bluebells and other things. And there's another view looking the other direction. So you can mix these things up so that you've got a really nice looking area. 
And your woods can look like this too. Here's my front yard at my old house in March, early March. The, my kids call these rocket plants. It's the blood root. They're coming up. The, uh, oh, what is that? Uh, geranium maculatum is hugging the ground. A few weeks later, the tulips and daffodils, which you can intermix with these perfectly well if you're doing it in somebody's yard and your wife wants some daffodils and tulips, they're not going to hurt anything in this situation. You don't want them in your woods. But in a yard, it helps balance things out. Here you can see the native plants are coming along. There's a lot of bluebells in bloom. About a week later, celandine poppies are in bloom. Some of the bluebells are still active over here and back there where the light conditions are a little different. A little bit later, we've got geraniums in bloom, celandine poppies, a couple of tulips are still going. Just a variety of plants in there. There are probably about 20 species in here. A little bit later, the columbine came up. This is how I learned columbine can get out of control. <laughs> they, they really came in here. And uh, you can see the geraniums. But again, you get the idea of if you know something about the characteristics of the plants, you can make a pretty good looking area. Here's one of my favorite plants, Jack in the Pulpit. These things, they grow. I, grow them three feet high without any trouble. I call them doorpost jacks. We used to have one on each side of the door. I mean, we call them doorpost jacks, but uh, they're an interesting plant. They make big seed pods. We'll talk about this more in my next talk, but they make great big seed pods with lots of seeds. They're very heavy seeds. They don't move around much, but they also around each mother plant, each year they generate some more bulbs. If you look at this one, for example, there's one, two, three, four buds on this bulb. If that bulb is planted next fall, there will be four bulbs about that size around this one. So if you're trying to get jack in the pulpits in your woods and you don't have very many, or you've got a neighbor with a lot of them, you can get seeds or you can very carefully excavate around the mother plant after it's dormant. You've got to mark them with a plastic straw so you can find them again. But if you go to a jack-in-the-pulpit growing in your neighbor's yard or something and you've got permission, if you dig up where the bulb was, there might be 20 or 30 bulbs. And you can put them scattered around. If you ever try to do something in your own woods, don't get all your plant material from the same little location. You want to get a genetic mix. And I don't know how good the, the commercial nurseries are at mixing up their genetics, but I assume they're reasonable at it. But if you've got 20 jack-in-the-pulpits in your 100-acre woods and you go get the berries, get a few berries from each one so you've got a genetic mix in the seeds you grow. Uh, something else to know. It's important to try and learn about your plants before you work on them. Uh, this is a jack-in-the-pulpit bulb as it's about to uh, send its shoot up. And what's interesting about some of these plants is their roots don't do what you think they do all the time. Jack in, this jack-in-the-pulpit, its root system, it goes out laterally. It doesn't go down. That might be because it's competing with oaks and hickories for soil moisture. And if the roots are right below the surface, it's got a better chance of getting moisture. But I don't know that for a fact, but it makes sense to me. But if you were to go and try and dig up a live jack in the pulpit, and you were going to dig it up like you might dig up corn or something, you might kill it by cutting off too many of its roots. And this is true of a lot of plants. Remember what I said about the spring beauty? The bulb might be here. The flower might be over here. And it's hard to find some of those things. So you want to be try and learn something about them if you're going to get into that. OK, that's the end of the formal slides. And 49 minutes and 35 seconds. That's not too bad. So do we have any questions? That was a lot of slides for a short presentation. I'm sorry. You talked about 
stop for a week or a winter bed? What do you plant that will give them something to eat the winter? I'm not aware of anything around here that would give nectar in the winter. There are plants, the, these early spring plants I've talked about, like Spring Beauty, some of these plants will bloom in Illinois, sometimes in early March even. And the bees, if it's warm enough for the bees, it's often warm enough for some of the plants. But I think most beekeepers put honey out for their, they put um, a sugary mixture out for their, their bees early in the season. But I'm not aware of any plant that you can have in the winter that would be capable of supporting bees. Um, excuse me. Um, what, one of the slides you showed us earlier um, that had the picture of the four, four di had the pictures of the four different bees. Um, what was the fourth one, the, the darker one? I was afraid somebody would ask me that. That's the one I don't know the name of. Um, I think it's Cimalobus ipomiae, but I'm not sure. But it, it's on Ipomea. How are we doing? We got some more questions? Oh, do you want to pick so I don't get beat up later? Because I got to give another talk. I don't want to make anybody mad. We'll clear the back room. Then we'll work our way forward. Yeah, one comment, one question. People who do the same thing that realize that the seed actually only goes down about a quarter of an inch. Not as deep as the root, you feel the seed is so deep. The question I have is about Dutchman juices. Do you know anything about transplanting or raising Dutchman juices from the seed? Yeah, that's in my next talk. But the simple answer is it's really hard to catch the seeds because the flower ripens. There's a little seed pod that's very weakly attached. The seeds are black, and you have to apply the Charmin test, which we'll talk about in my next talk. But the what? You can bag them. And I use uh, the vinyl window screen and a stapler to do mine. You can also use window gauze or that lacy curtain material. You take the red berries, you squeeze the berries out of the red, you squeeze the seeds out of the berries, and as soon as you can, you plant the seeds in a quarter inch of soil. Require Mine don't, I've grown them for decades. Okay. And if you see the next talk, I've put as many as 150 seeds in a six inch pot and recovered almost all the bulbs the next, at the end of the season, so. The big what? The ants yeah. Are right. Do those grow in much larger colonies? Oh no, no. That was that picture. That ant hill is only about five inches across. Oh, because I have ant hills that one colony covers about an acre. But there are maybe seventy. Yeah. Hills. You've probably got the big formicas. Formica. Are they good, bad, indifferent? They're not bad. They're not in. They're they're not going to hurt anything. They're not going to hurt anything. And they aerate the soil. Exactly. They turn over the soil. A lot of the, I really hate the commercials on TV now that basically say if there's an ant in your yard, spray, because it might get in your house. Most of the ants in your yard are in your yard because they're supposed to be in your yard, and they don't like the house. The ants in the house are most likely Asian or South American invaders who came into the country. So. The, the, the other thing I want to mention, while you, you, meant you tweaked my mind there, if you're applying fertilizer, if you have a lawn company come and work on your house or your yard, check before they spray. A lot of them, they put fertilizer, herbicide, and insecticide on all at once. And that wreaks havoc with any plant that might help a bee and all the bees that nest in the ground are affected by that insecticide, the ants. It's, it's a terrible thing to do. You should only use insecticide on your lawn if you have an entomological problem on your lawn that requires insecticide. Don't do it preventively. Uh, I, on my woods, I've kind of worked and got touch me knots for hummingbirds. What, any of these plants that you're talking about, can they attract hummingbirds? Um, the columbine attracts hummingbirds. 
There's a, there's a lot of native plants that do hummingbirds. I've seen hummingbirds on uh, Solomon seal, true Solomon seal. Very few of them, mind you, but they will use that as a resource. But most of the plants I've dealt with are not hummingbird plants. What's, what's the best plant to use? Uh, somebody else here might know the answer. It's a red plant with a big tube on it. Is what? Trumpet vine is a very good plant for hummingbirds. Um, they'll also go to cardinal flower, which will grow on the woodland edge. And a lot of these plants would grow well on the edge. And I'm talking about woodland wildflowers because that's what I know about, but there are many, many trees, like redbud is an excellent tree for insect pollinators, particularly bees. Um, there's just any number of them, salix. Uh, Salix and the willow, Salix nigra, Salix interior. Many, many different bees and other spring insects use the Salix. So, but I, don't, I just don't know much about hummingbirds. We got, we got time for one more of those. Um, what's the impact of deer browsing on most of the wild, wildfire? Disastrous. The <laughs> trilliums are in huge problem. I call deer venison just like I call hostas hostels. <laughs> Is what? Yeah, there's that too. But the deer are really hurting many of the prairie species and the woodland species. There's a few that they don't eat at all. But you know, the deer, when they're hungry, they strip trees up as high as they can reach. And in, in uh, Cook County, Illinois, if you're in the forest preserve, the browse line is about here. And you can see for miles. <laughs> It's, it's bad. Deer, deer like, like geese, where I live, we just had a big public hearing on geese because we didn't have any geese for a long time. And then we got a few and everybody was happy and they were managed and they were protected. And it was a wonderful success story. Otters the same way. But we're very good at managing something back, but not at keeping it at a reasonable level. And we're absolutely horrible at invasive plants because frequently the USDA brought them in for some reason, and then they escaped all over the place. So I think garlic mustard is one of the few that was brought in by English. But most of the rest of them came in compliments of the government. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, right now, there's a little bit of intermission, so you can go down into the heritage level and meet exhibitors. And yeah, where is the handout? Um, what? I would check where.